reboot this. So we're kind of halfway through this, and we made the point that, you know, Einstein wasn't the first person to ever talk about a black hole, the idea of these dark stars, and escape velocity, which is in and of itself an important concept, um, existed. The you know, first person to write it down, at least, was in 1783. So this is this persistent idea. And we talked a little bit about the conceptual idea behind general relativity, which is really we got to replace this for, at first, aesthetic and then practical reasons for something that doesn't transmit information instantly. So the idea that, you know, the it's basically okay for us. You know, we're, believe it or not, Earth is moving so slowly around the sun, even at that 30 kilometers per second, that the fact that it takes gravitational information eight minutes to get from the sun to us, that's the speed of light travel time. Um, doesn't really mess with our orbit too much. But then as you start getting out into the cosmos, the finite speed of light and information travel, and therefore gravity, um, will actually become a really important role. So for all this stuff, Newton's gravity is totally okay. Exoplanets, Trojan asteroids, piloting stuff around our solar system. Um, even, believe it or not, and you can hassle people about this today, the uh, assumption that you can basically treat gravity as moving instantaneously for uh, an orbit around um, the center of a galaxy is totally fine. Okay, But then we started talking about these, at first, subtle philosophical nuances. One is that how does gravity affect light, if at all? Because if you take Newton very seriously, I would need to multiply by mass to get the force. Well, the mass of a photon packet of light is zero, and then I would have to divide it back out, so I have did the divide by zero errors cancel? What's going on? Does this thing drop and hit the uh, face of the moon if I were to put a photon trapped in between two mirrors? So the idea was maybe we'll talk about this not in terms of dropping stuff, but in terms of throwing stuff. So you can calculate the escape velocity um, from a planet or a moon or some gravitating massive body. And just like the speed at which you fall, the acceleration at which you fall, sorry, um, that only depends on the mass of the body that's pulling you. So it doesn't matter what it is. It could be an apple. It could be a spaceship. If you get something moving at 14 kilometers per second from the surface of Earth, it's out into the cosmos. And maybe that's true for light, too. So you could get an escape velocity that's higher than the speed of light. And this was the original idea behind dark stars. And people kind of looked off and on. Weirdly, this is uh, what we ended up finding is a patch of dark sky with a bunch of stars orbiting it at the center of our galaxy. So uh, old idea was the good idea. But the modern way of talking about it requires relativity. So special relativity, this theory that Einstein proposed to reconcile some stuff with the speed of light, says that no anything travels faster than light speed. No, certainly light doesn't. That's the definition. Um, Gravity doesn't, information doesn't, no matter what you read in the newspaper and once every five years somebody says we went faster than the speed of light, they're either tweaking the definition or they're absolutely wrong and it'll be discovered in a couple of months, so you can't do this. And this is doing this, so we had to fix it. Math is evil, but the philosophy behind it is that um, there's no such thing as space and time as these distinct concrete uh, ideas is that we live in a rather fluid, pliable space-time, and the influence of mass and um, energy is to warp it. So if I'm really close to a very, very massive body, space curves to pull things towards the massive body. It's not reaching out to me and putting a force on me. It's just locally curving its own space-time. And it makes my clocks run slower as I get towards it. Um, if I were to make the the density or the mass bigger and bigger and bigger, I could increase the warpage of space-time, and at some point I could make space-time so warped that light couldn't escape. So we're back to dark stars. And the original reason for doing this wasn't to predict black holes, it was to just reconcile this finite speed of light thing. Because the idea of uh, space-time and gravity as a warpage of space-time is that if I grab this 10 kilogram ball and I shake it, well, its influence in gravity is going to ripple out at the speed of light like um, waves in a pond or something like that. So that's what we got to. And I encourage you, I actually still haven't checked if this link is active, but it's Brian Green talking about GR. And he does a really good job, actually. So 
Um, that's all we can talk about that, except to say that the Dark Star idea is starting to gain a little bit of traction, circa you know, 1950 or so. People are like, well, this is maybe why we don't see any thousand solar mass stars out in the cosmos, is that's do not report to fusion, report directly to space-time rip and black hole. Before that, in kind of an edgy, not quite statistically significant experiment, uh, people affected the, observed the effect of gravity on light in, during a solar eclipse in 1919, where the stars very close to the sun as this eclipse were happening seemed to have perturbed a little bit from where you would see them six months later when the sun is way on the other side of the sky. So imagine this thing kind of like bent out a little bit and the farther stars were totally in the same positions. A little bit is much less than I was saying, uh, indicating with my fingers. It was a very small effect. But they saw it, so people are pretty happy with it. The modern version of this, it's so-called gravitational lensing where gravity bends light and it can make what seems to be um, a pretty weird imperfect lens, but it does lensing stuff in two ways. One, it can magnify something. So it can actually make it appear brighter because you collect more photons. Twice as many have been bent towards you as would have been otherwise. So they magnify in the way that a magnifying glass would magnify. You do get more light from the thing. And secondly, they lens in the sense that they bend light. So gravity acting as a lens, and the famous one is Einstein's cross. And we know it's a gravitational lensing event because, and not just like some random collection of things that seem to be equally bright and kind of look the same is this, 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 and this all have the same spectra. And closer to home, it turns out that um, a quark in Mercury's orbit, which previously had been unexplained, people thought there may have even been like a sub-Mercury that was even closer, perturbing its orbit. Believe it or not, the planet was called Vulcan. This is before Star Trek. It's maybe the, uh, I don't know, reason why that name was chosen. And so GR explains this procession of Mercury's orbit, very small procession, and the fact that GR treats spinning masses differently than stationary masses needs to be taken into account if you want your phone to tell you where you are within the block. So this is now you know, very well accepted. I wouldn't say garden variety, but you, know, you need this in your everyday life. And the last um, frontier of general relativity up until you know, September 14th or 15th, I forget, of last year was to detect these dynamic ripples in space-time. So you need a really energetic event. So you need something so um, energetic and powerful that you're actually compressing space-time to the point where you would actually see some, um, some noticeable result. And this is an interferometer arm. So this thing can measure deformations in one part in 10 to the minus 21, all things told, which means nothing to anybody. It's like such a crazy number. Um, what it really would mean is they can detect changes in one of the lengths of these arms of the interferometer relative to the other one um, to less resolution, like a thousandth of a proton or something. So it would be like the width of the human hair on the scale of here to Alpha Centauri. So it's just a fantastic technical achievement to do this. And finally, it saw ripples in space-time, and we'll talk about what ripples it saw. So even nuttier, it's actually not nutty because the other one worked, is... Uh, to make a three-pronged interferometer out at one of Earth's Lagrange points, and this thing would be able to see things that are even more delicate and sensitive. Um, Lisa has some funding issues, but maybe those get resolved because LIGO was successful. But all of this is gravitational radiation. This is not Newton's theory. Newton would have nothing to do with this. This is all general relativity and gravity waves. Um, I'll leave this up so you can hear and giggle about what some poor schmuck's PhD thesis was. like just. Um, light wiggles very quickly. So if you're observing light, you're seeing an electromagnetic field that's oscillating at you know, 10 to the 14th times per second or 10 to the 15th times per second. It's like almost an unfathomable number. So if I'm spinning something around like this, that's like 2 hertz. We're talking about 2 with 15 zeros after it hertz for light. For sound, uh, sorry, for gravitational radiation, there are things that will emit gravity waves at like 10 hertz, 15 hertz, 100 hertz, 1,000 hertz. So instead of false color like we do for you know, painting pretty pictures of x-rays, people use false sound. So you're not actually hearing the cosmos, and you're not actually hearing gravitational radiation. 
but it's the right frequency band to sound like music. So there are, people talk about them as chirps and beeps and clicks. And so a neutron star orbiting another neutron star in gravitational radiation would sound like this. It's fairly underwhelming, but a lot of work goes into it. OK, so that's general relativity, the kind of brief version. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, if I introduce some perturbation, like I take some mass and some energy, which is curving space time, and I poke it or I shake it, that information speeds away from the perturbed thing at the speed of light. So let me say it like this. Don't ask me how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to get rid of the sun. So just like pull it out of our universe so we have no more sun. We're actually going to proceed in our orbit for another eight minutes before that information gets to us. So for eight minutes, we'll just be orbiting absolutely nothing until the, um, the signal from the sun's disappearance get to us, and then we fly off in a straight line afterwards. It's right. It's, uh, if there's no perturbation whatsoever, it still takes eight minutes, but it's eight minutes of saying same things happening. Yeah. So it's, we're kind of on hold, you know. That is what the special theory of relativity in the postulates, like the stuff that you would carve in the side of a, a granite building, is no information travels faster than the speed of light. So you can't, you know, things that have no mass could travel at the speed of light. So, yeah. So light has no mass, so light can travel at the speed of, well, I mean, it's almost hard to finish the sentence. Light travels at the speed of light. Um, for a while, people thought neutrinos traveled at the speed of light, but it turns out they have infinitesimally small masses. Um, so gravitational radiation, there's a quantum particle that people think is associated with it. The graviton would move at the speed of light because that's also massless. But yeah, anything that has mass, it's got to, it, it would be very hard to get to the speed of light, but you can get pretty close with a lot of energy. Yeah. Other so now you have two uh, two warnings: is don't don't look at the sun and don't annihilate the sun. So you have eight minutes of life left on Earth. Okay, just because we're here and we just finished talking about high mass stars, is we also have option two for a core collapse high mass star, is that you know all of the sea of electrons and protons just manage to find each other and in a cataclysm turn into a ball of neutrons taking up a lot less space. The center of the core collapses, the star starts rushing in, bounces off the neutron star. We get an explosion, uh, type one, or sorry, type two supernova. The other option is that this valiant band of neutrons actually does not fend off the gravity which is on rushing and going to crush it. And in that case, what you do is you get so much matter and energy compressed into some region of space. We now know the, you know, the cutoff for that is if you bend space time so much with your high density that light cannot escape, one-way trip to black hole. So that's option two. And in a high mass star, you can make a black hole. The cutoff for that mass is about eight solar masses or so. Okay. So black holes are predicted classically in the modern theory of gravity. Um, they've been observed, which we'll get to in a second, directly and indirectly. Uh, for a while, people weren't really sure, and so like this is, you know, this is like nonsense. You can't rip a hole in space-time. I don't like the fact that there's like an exit door to some other dimension or whatever. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's settled. They exist. So it's worthwhile talking about what is a black hole. Well, there are two things. There's the singularity, and the singularity is infinitely small. So the singularity is the place where you're dividing one by zero, and the equations break. So there's not much to talk about there. It's like the dead center throat of the black hole. And again, these are 2D cartoons. In real life, it would be something that's spherical, and you would just see a lot of really highly warped uh, light around it. And then right at the center of the sphere would be the terrible infinity. The part that people talk about when they talk about um, the size of a black hole is the so-called event horizon. But the thing to mention before talking about that is that a black hole has a mass. It was the mass that fell into the event horizon. Far away from the black hole, you really have no sense that this mass is different than any other mass. And if I had a one solar mass cloud of really cold helium or something that was completely innocuous and I was orbiting it really far away at 
you know, 15 AU or something. Um, I wouldn't know the difference in between that and orbiting a one solar mass black hole. The mass is the mass. So you see these things in sci-fi films every once in a while, and they're, they're evil and deadly and dark, and maybe they make some like low-grade sucking noise or this vibratory thing. It's not true. It's just mass. You know, We could replace our sun by a one solar mass black hole, and we would just merrily go around in the dark. Okay, so it's got no surface to stand on, and it emits no radiation, which isn't quite true. Um, but for our purposes, unless somebody really wants to know about Hawking radiation, they just are dark. Okay, so the singularity is infinitely small, but the event horizon is the part that people usually talk about, and this depends on the mass. The bigger the mass, the bigger the event horizon. So this is the point of no return, the point at which you know, you're know you getting closer and closer, and you're shining a laser pointer back at your friend saying, it's okay, I'm fine. They stop seeing the laser pointer at the event horizon, and then they never see you again. As you're getting to the event horizon, the laser pointer starts getting redder and redder and redder in infrared because it's got to crawl out of the gravity well, but they could still see it. At the event horizon, information is cut off. You can't, your friend can't communicate to you. You could drop them a note into the black hole, but they would never be able to get it back, get a response out to you. So these are, there's a pretty big rate of compression to put some of this stuff in perspective. And to make the mass, uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy seem even more terrifying is if I were to crush Earth into a black hole, the event horizon would be about this big. So all the mass of planet Earth would make a black hole. The sun would make a black hole about the size of Green Lake, so neutron stars are pretty close. A neutron star would be about the size of maybe Seattle overall, solar mass neutron star. A solar mass black hole would be you know, downtown Seattle, maybe even a little bit less. But this is the event horizon, right? So this is the point of no return. The thing at the center of our galaxy has an event horizon of 40 astronomical units, which is what you guys computed on exercise one. So this is a monster. This is about 4.3 million times the mass of our sun. Yeah. So a tiny black hole, like an Earth mass black hole, it would have, well, I mean, it would affect the moon, like if we got rid of the Earth and we replaced it with this marble-sized black hole, the moon would just continue being uh, pulled around in orbit and would orbit once every 28 days. So it'd have so much gravity that it would just be tugging the moon around, even though the point of no return would be that big. It would be so dense and have such a strong gravity close to it that the tidal forces on things like us would be incredible and difficult. So I'll actually... I'm going to presume the question that you're kind of asking is, what would happen if I got really close to it? And I'm going to let somebody else answer that, because they have this whole like spiel about it. Um, but honestly, it would just do all the gravity things, aside from tidal forces, that Earth would do. So the mass of Earth. It would pull the moon around. Um, the new stuff is that if you get really close to this two centimeters, it would have much stronger differential gravity, like tide forces. So the part of my finger, if I wanted to poke it, this part of my finger would experience a much stronger force than that, and that might be trouble. But hold that thought for a couple of minutes, because it's like a whole Neil deGrasse Tyson like comedy routine on this, basically. There's no other way to describe it. Yeah. So that gets kind of weird, and um, people... Yeah. Right. So... Technically, there's, there are two ways for the real black hole dorks, is that black holes are formally like black holes are a solution to Einstein's equations of general relativity that could always exist in time. It's just like a, a solution. A physical black hole is something that used to be normal matter, and you compressed it to this point of no return, and then it started falling down the rabbit hole. And at that point, you might be saying, like, well, now I have to start caring about my accounting of time. Because remember that time moves more slowly as you get closer to a gravity well. Right? So your friend in the penthouse apartment is going to die a billionth of a second before you do if you, you know, you've, you've had the same lifetimes um, without general relativity. So as you get closer to the black hole, time slows down. So it's almost... Either beautifully or frustratingly, it's a hard question to answer, is that in a physical black hole that was made from normal matter that was collapsed 
and is falling down the throat of infinity. From your perspective, yeah, you're not allowed to ask. I mean, you're allowed to ask, but I can say, like, well, from my perspective, it'll never get there. So it never gets to the infinity in our frame, like as people who look at black holes. So if you go down the black hole, then you know, you're free to ask in the scant moments you have left of life. But technically speaking, they're physical black holes, and they're, you know, they're eventually going to make these things, but it takes an infinite amount of time from our perspective to do so. So we were kind of absolved from answering this question about, so is all the, all the matter at infinity or at zero or whatever? Like, you don't have to ask, because for us it would never happen. Yes, so black holes can evaporate, and this is the kind of uh, equivocation I made about no radiation, quote unquote. This is actually the work of um, Stephen Hawking. The reason he's famous is he figured out black holes have a temperature, and if they have a temperature, then they're radiating particles. Um, and I can show you guys the mechanism for how that works, like really quickly. Um, but get through this. Suck. So, any questions about like the anatomy of black holes? It's pretty simple. There's the point of death and the ring of death. So, yeah. Yeah, black holes don't come in a continuum, and this is, it's a jargony word, but everybody knows what you mean, is black holes, as far as we've been able to observe, they come in like solar mass-ish, 10 solar masses, 5 solar mass, 20 solar masses, and then they come in monsters. So like a billion solar masses or, you know, 100 million solar masses. And nobody's ever seen a 100 solar mass or like 500 or 1,000 solar mass black hole, because there's kind of a gap. So they're either solar mass-ish or they're ginormous, freaking huge, at the center of a galaxy, always at the center of a galaxy. So it does. It, it would mean something to somebody in an astronomy department. OK. So really quickly, there's a 5 in there that I need, didn't update either, is how do we detect black holes? Because now we believe they exist. And you can't see them because unless you can see Hawking radiation, which I wouldn't really believe you, um, you should be out using your powers for good or something, is we don't see them, they're black, right? So what we have to do is we have to infer their presence from other things until last September at least. And the short story is we can see their gravitational influence on entire other bodies. They can pull things that are bright around them. Um, that could be a whole body like a star, a blob of gas called an accretion disk, or it can pull the light itself around, and that's gravitational lensing or microlensing. And then finally, we can detect their birth pangs. In the, every once in a while, a core collapse supernova will occur. Um, and we detect them in very, very high intensity, um, uh, high frequency light. So this is the dark star. And you've seen it a couple of times, but this is an animation over the course of a whole bunch of years. Um, so this is a black patch of nothing. There's nothing there. And these are a whole bunch of stars over the course of maybe, I think, about 10 years or so. And you can see how they're orbiting this black patch of nothing stars, right? So things 10 to the 30th kilograms of crap being pulled around by nothing. So there's got to be a black hole there. And just as you guys did on exercise five is, what's the mass of the black hole? Well, what do you need to know? All you need to know and have a calculator to find them is what? I need to know. need to know the period and the distance. Yeah, so that's it. You can calculate it. And um, I would watch this. We don't have enough time in class. But there's a good 10-minute clip of the guy who took all of this painstaking data. And you'll see him like, pull out a pocket calculator and do stuff that you guys did on exercises 1, 4, and 5. And he kind of stumbles through it a little bit, which is why I think it's nice. It's like, oh man, I can detect black holes if that guy can. Um, but it's kind of neat. Also, the description of the telescope, it's, uh, this is um, infrared because this is at the center of the galaxy. It's got to see through a lot of dust and gas. But that's Sagittarius A star. That's our supermassive black hole. There are individual pictures of you know, not whole stars, but this really hot gas uh, being pulled around by, again, seemingly nothing. So before we saw pictures like this, but there was always like an aperture in front of it. There was like a little black disk that was popped there and said like, you know, we're blocking out the star. Here there's no star to block out. So here there's really, really bright disk, a uh, flat disk of gas, and it's emitting x-rays, it's so hot, and it's funneling into nothing. 
and you can figure out how much energy through like black body and energy techniques that it has and the only thing that could be eating it is something on the order of a solar mass but it's really 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 tiny so it must be a black hole and then outside of it you have plasma stuff's really hot so it's got no you know the electrons and protons aren't connected in atoms and it's spinning around so you get a jet and you can see a jet and the properties of the jet would tell you that it must be getting really close to something so accretion disks and jets with nothing noticeable, no bright star doing the pulling and the um, pulling and the spinning, has got to be a black hole. So people have seen this. So this whole thing is uh, hundreds of light years and then thousands of light years. But you know, there would, you would be able to see a star if there was a star there. Okay. Then finally, microlensing is just a really small scale version of exactly what we showed you. So a compact object pulls around light. I just want to. Um, show you what state of the art in microlensing is. This is a really hard row to hoe, is that this is light, and then this is the light after the black hole has passed in front of it. To you, does the scream, oh yeah, a black hole, smoking gun. Uh, this is taken from a real talk and real paper, and they're very happy with their microlensing events. So the microlensing community is just you know, very, very nerdy and sedated, I think. But this is the stuff they look for, is that this must be a compact object doing this slight pulling of gravity. And this is more of a survey thing. It's not like you know, nobody's going to run out and celebrate this thing. It's just we'd like to know how many there are in the, in the solar system, sorry, in the galaxy in general. And then finally, these gamma ray bursts. Um, this is from the Fermi satellite, but these were actually discovered even earlier in the 1960s. And um, may have almost brought us to the brink of global thermonuclear war because why were satellites up in orbit detecting gamma ray radiation in the 1960s and 70s? Yeah, so nuclear testing. It had nothing to do with astronomy. So Hubble Space Telescope took until like 1989. Um, and the military was not being so nice to say, like, you know, we got you covered in gamma rays. You can figure out visible light. So basically, these satellites, American satellites, were up looking for nuclear tests, and they kept seeing things. It was like, oh man, the Russians are detecting, blowing up, you know, nukes in the outer atmosphere at the rate of one every couple of months or something like that. That's nuts. Um, fortunately, the signatures of the gamma rays just didn't match up with the nuclear test, and they realized they were astronomical. A couple of scientists fought to get the um, data out there and to classify, partly because if the Soviets were about to launch their own nuclear detection satellites, you'd like them to know in public, like, you guys are going to see this too. Let's all chill out. There's some big astronomical signal out there. Um, so the interesting thing about them is they came from everywhere. So they weren't in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, which is what this is. But if they're everywhere, they would, you know, if you assumed that they were outside of our galaxy, extragalactic, Turns out they were just such an absurd amount of energy, you know, like uh, imagine the entire sun burning through its, you know, 10 billion years of nuclear fuel in about, you know, a week or something like that. So it's just this tremendous amount of energy. And the only possible explanation could be when the neutrons lose in a core collapse supernova, the energy that you get by dropping down the well of infinity, or at least until you get to the event horizon, is enough energy with some extra effects. If it happens to be directed right at Earth, you see it. So these gamma ray bursts, there's really, there's no other plausible explanation for them. And then finally, there's this. So again, finally, this worked. Um, and I'll forget which one's which. I just want to show you one of these and leave the other one. Um, yeah, so this is one of these chirps. <laughs> and again, this is not really the universe like making this noise. It's just they, instead of false color for gravity waves, there's false sound. So, um, and the two different versions that you hear, um, LIGO has two ears. There's one in Hanford and central Washington, and there's one in Livingston, Louisiana. And the reason they knew that this was a real thing is because they were the same signal, but they, these are shifted. So they didn't show up at the same time. So it was detected in 
um, Livingston first and then Hanford. Why is that? So they had to offset these signals a little bit. And it was seven milliseconds. So why would it take, or maybe the more obscure way of phrasing it is, why was this thing detected seven milliseconds earlier at point A rather than point B, this gravitational? That is the time it takes at the speed of light to get through the Earth by line of sight from Louisiana to Hanford. So, and that's also how you know it was gravitational radiation. It was offset by light travel time. So this is two black holes in spiraling. The two different chirp chirps is that one is the high pitched chirp is them playing it at actual frequencies. That one. And then the lower thump is they, um, they took it down. My personal theory on that is that the senior scientists who have been working on this have been doing it for so long that I don't think biologically they could hear the actual frequency. <laughs> As you get older, your hearing goes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the principal scientists, so actually, there's, there's bits from the whole press conference here, right here, so you may as well uh, scroll down. Two colliding blocks. Not this guy. First video, all right, the stars behind them are warped, and that's because the strong gravitational fields and the light. That Artistic out. representation, but of what course. I want you to pay attention to in this video is the fact that as they orbit, the black holes oh. are getting closer and closer to one another. The orbit is speeding up, and eventually they're going to merge. The, the event horizons are going to join. Boom. Okay. Uh, yeah, not everybody pictured, but this guy and then Kip Thorne on the right, they're, def they're squarely in their 80s, and they've been working on this project for... There's a third principal investigator who's actually uh, too ill to... I, I don't even know if he understands that they were successful. So these guys... Hopefully they hustle through the Nobel Prize, actually. Um, yep, so here's, um, this isn't exactly the same scenario, but this is something um, similar. So this would be, so nobody knows why these two large black holes that merged did so. This is one scenario where a core collapse supernova occurred. So this is the infall, and then there's the bounce. And out of the ejected matter, two 20, 30 solar mass black holes are formed. And then they would inspiral. So they orbit each other, and they lose energy. So notice the axes are shifting. And then they wobble together really quickly. So you can lose energy in a whole bunch of ways. And a really good way of losing energy is to try to deform a black hole. So there's actually, um, it's a static theorem, but it happens really quickly for things that are moving and evolving. Is the joke is black holes have no hair. There's nothing distinguishing about them. So if you try to, at the moment where they merge and they kind of look warped, very, very quickly they'll ring down into a perfect sphere. So that's why it like really quickly relaxed. And all of this, I don't know what this time is, but this is the sort of thing that you would see, and hey, it's the chirp. So the reason they knew exactly what it was within you know, hours of seeing the signal was the fact that the simulations, the numerical relativity simulation said, you know, this is what you'll see for two black holes in spiraling and colliding. And that's exactly what they saw. And it was, you know, they put, one was 24 solar masses, one was 32 solar masses. They lost three solar masses of mass energy during the collision. So it took a paper clip, like half a gram, to annihilate Hiroshima. Um, three times the mass of the sun was released in this collision, which is why we we're finally able to see that. So they claim this is the first like direct detection of black holes. Um, and I think that's, that's a fair thing to say. So all the other evidence was compelling, but it was all indirect. But nothing else could have been this. There's like two black holes that end spiraled. And we saw them. We just didn't see them with light. We saw them with their gravitational radiation. Okay. So that was last September. And the paper came out in February. And everybody's like really excited. Okay. Any questions about that? OK, so now back to the stuff that everybody wants to know is what's inside a black hole and what happens when I push my friend in? Right? Just kidding. So. The same 
this is actually a little bit underwhelming because you really do expect the world to change once you take that magic step across the event horizon, but it's not true. Um, so especially for something like our supermassive black hole, is the universe outside the event horizon, two steps outside the event horizon, basically looks exactly like the universe two steps inside of the event horizon. You might, may not even know that you passed the point of no return and your life is about to be very weird and very short. Um, so there's curved space-time outside, there's curved space-time inside. There's nothing like really necessarily magical about the event horizon aside from the fact that your friends outside who aren't you can't see you. Um, to be fair, the curved space-time itself, whether just outside or just inside the event horizon, especially for a very small, compact black hole, might be really interesting. So light is so strongly curved that you could imagine these scenarios where you stand here and I shine a flashlight this way and the light is so curved it actually orbits the way that like a planet might, hits the back of my head, bounces off and comes back. So you would be looking at the back of your own head or something like that. So all sorts of wild things could happen. And curved space time, you know, that strongly curved space time would be pretty weird in and of itself. But the event horizon is not this, you know, magical whatever um, boundary that you cross into this other realm. Uh, people try to believe that the singularity might be connected to something, and these are these ideas behind like wormholes and white holes and black holes, is that I think it just bothers people to have a hanging thread in the universe. And so they imagine that this singularity gets connected back out to somewhere else, and they just kind of sew it back in or something. And you drive your spaceship through the black hole, and then you pop out on the other side or something like that. But that's actually not what would happen. And the real truth about what would happen if you fell into a black hole, um, this is better explanation than I can give. Uh, this is like... If you fail to fall in love with someone, you'll no. stay here. You'll turn into an animal. Uh, whatever this is, don't see it or buy it. For it TV. Looks terrible. The world is thinking. Okay. What happens is gravity of the black hole is e extreme, as you can this? imagine. Light doesn't even escape. Its gravity is so extreme. Light traveling at the speed of light, right? Like, put that in context, if you wanted to escape the Earth, it's actually possible to do that, contrary to what your grandparents told you, where they said, what goes up must come down. That's just not true. They, well, there's nothing your grandparents ever threw that never came down, but with rockets, with high enough speed, you can send something so it never comes back. For Earth, that speed is seven miles per second. We call it the escape velocity. But if I throw something, oh, I've got apples here. Um, <laughs> if I throw this not fast enough, it comes back. So most of life experience tells you that what goes up comes up. Seven miles per second, this never comes back. It goes to the edge of the universe there. Okay, so now it turns out on, the, on a black hole, the escape velocity is so high that you have to, speed of light is not good enough. So if light doesn't come out, nothing's coming out, it's black, you fall in, you're not coming out, it's a one-way trip, okay? So if you die this way, you won't get to tell anyone how you died, that he, for start. But second, as you fall in, you don't just die because you disappear. You, you die long before you disappear. As you fall in, the gravity at your feet becomes rapidly greater than the gravity at your head. Now, now it turns out, as if you stand on Earth, that fact is true under those conditions as well, because your feet are closer to Earth's center than the top of your head is. So your feet actually feel a stronger <laughs> force of gravity, but not by much. Because if you're you know, five feet tall, six feet tall, and Earth is like 4,000 miles in radius, that difference is not that great. <laughs> compared with the distance to the center of the Earth. Black hole, they're so small, so compact, that your height becomes, your height matters as you fall in towards the black hole. So your feet start falling faster than your head does. That's a bad situation to be in. <laughs> you don't really, now initially you kind of feel good, you know? Because it, it's, every, you, we all stretch when you wake up in the morning. Initially, it feels like a stretch. Right, sort of general relativity kind of yoga. Okay, it's a kind of yoga, cosmic yoga. But what happens is that stretch continues beyond comfort levels. 
and you reach a point where, and they're called the tidal forces, tides on your body, basically. The tidal force can so great that they exceed the intermolecular forces that bind your flesh. And so the point comes where you snap into two pieces, likely to happen at the base of your spine. Now you are two pieces. Now, it turns out, now I know you didn't ask about this, but <laughs> I got a whole chapter on it. I got it. So, it turns out you will survive that snap because below your waist, while there are important organs, there are no vital organs below your waist. So, your torso will stay alive for a little while, okay, until you bleed to death, but this all happens much faster than it would take to bleed to death. So, these two pieces then feel tidal forces, and then they snap into two pieces, and then they snap again into eight, and then 16, and then you're bifurcating your way down. And so, eventually, it's your head and multiple other parts, and so, that will continue until you are a stream of atoms descending toward the abyss. And it turns out that's not the worst of it. <laughs> okay? The worst. It turns out the fabric of space and time funnels down towards a black hole. So the space that you occupy up here is larger than the space you occupy down here. So in fact, you're getting, while you're getting stretched, you're getting squeezed, extruded through the fabric of space like toothpaste through a tube. Now, we have a word for that. It's called spaghettification. Okay? So, invented for just this purpose. One thing we're good at in English is having words for ways to die. <laughs> Right? We have a word if you kill someone else, a word if you, a different word if you kill yourself, a different word if you're killed by electricity, a different word, I mean, all words for how to die. Add some gamification to it. Okay. So any other black hole questions? So this is a question that I don't know. Um, I'm sure that somebody could could give you the correct answer because the correct answer is the fact that just as like the force of force of gravity, quote unquote, um, is different in between your feet and your head. You would actually to answer that properly, you'd have to ask a biologist about the perception of time because the conception of time in between your feet and your head change too. And we tend to also not care about that on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, you, you think about what you see and what you feel as simultaneous. But it's actually not true. It takes, like, um, like just under a tenth of a second for nervous information to get from your toes to your head. And your brain has this kind of uh, fuzzy circuit in it that corrects for that so that you don't get really freaked out when you see somebody prick the bottom of your feet with a pin, and then you feel it slightly later. So there's actually something weird about the perception of time, and I think that's the real question about that. Is this terrible stuff's happening to your feet, and how do you perceive it? But for you, the short answer is that for a single particle, which in this case you're not yet, um, you carry around what's called, or Einstein called your proper time, and that's your watch. So you have like this personal stopwatch that goes with you. And your perception of your proper time, your personal time, doesn't change. It's the rest of the world that seems out of whack to you. So you have a twin, and your twin goes at you know, 9 tenths of the speed of light, Alpha Centauri. You actually think that they're aging more quickly. They think that you're aging more quickly. So slowly, sorry. So, but then you, you, know, you have to resolve that when you get back together. But the short story is that like, you think everything's fine-ish. It's just everything else, everybody else has a bad perception of time. It's like this weird solipsism of the universe. It's like, my proper time's fine, the rest of you are weird. Yeah. 
know if that was like the answer. <laughs> Any other questions? The Jets, yeah. To, yeah, the, well, I mean, depending on what you mean by perceived, the idea that you would have, you know, seven or eight black holes and they're all kind of perfectly aligned where their jets are in one direction it's probably not some phenomenon where they know in some gravitational sense where each other are now and are aligning them. Maybe there was something that caused them all to form a long time ago, or maybe they're primordial black holes and they picked some you know, axis of symmetry back when the universe was a lot smaller. But to grab a black hole with a jet, and if you've ever done this where you have a top, like a gyroscope that's spinning and you grab it and you spin it over, and it seems like it takes more force than it should, yeah, the whole conservation of angular momentum thing. Okay, try doing that with a 10 solar mass thing that's spinning at thousands of times per second, you know. So to manually move a black hole jet through some agency, especially very far away, would be really difficult, I think is you know, the assumption that they're making. It's based on what people know about angular momentum and um, Newton's laws, is that you have a gyroscope and it's spinning in this direction. It's going to be really hard to take it and spin it and flip it over. So the, what probably, what is more likely is that something aligned them in the far past. Or, I don't know, at some point, somewhere out there, somebody has flipped nine heads in a row. You know, There's got to be some random shit luck in the cosmos. Okay, so this is the black hole temperature thing and why this guy's so famous. Um, so it turns out that there's this interface in between particle physics and black hole stuff, and that bubbling out of the ether, you can have an electron, matter and antimatter come together and collide and annihilate and stuff like that. Not science fiction, happens every day at particle accelerators all over this Earth. Um, so you'd have, you know, like an electron and a positron, and you get to the right temperature, they just boil out of the cosmos and come back together. Usually, and very quickly recombine and annihilate because you have a positive and a negative charge. They attract, they bubble back together. If you try to pull this trick at the edge of an event horizon, so you have matter and antimatter bubble out of the cosmos as it wants to do, half of it will fall in potentially. And now what you've done is you basically created what seems to be radiation at the edge of the black hole. So the black hole, half of the matter and antimatter pairs will start frying off. And so it seems like the black hole has a temperature. And after a while, in a way, it's as if, in a complicated way, the black hole is creating matter and radiating it away. And the stuff will be moving relativistically, so it has a chance of getting away. So black holes have lifetimes and temperatures through this effect. Um, it will take you know, billions of billions of years to vaporize even a moderately sized black hole. So it's not like a big deal. But the good news is, is you can make a black hole through accident at Fermilab or something like that, and it'll be a tiny one, and it'll evaporate away before it'll eat the Earth. So I like this picture just because it's, it's pretty swag. Um, okay. So this is so-called Hawking radiation. Um, really far away, it kind of looks like the black hole itself is crackling off some, some light and some particles. Um, so what I want to do, I guess, because that took some time, is uh, questions about exercise seven. Um, Chris will give a talk, and then hopefully we can get through just like Doppler shift, just the Doppler shift part of exoplanets, and we'll finish exoplanets on Wednesday.